Mr. Ambassador, you've endorsed uh, former Vice President Joe Biden now. Tell us why he is the right, the best candidate for the Democratic Party. Well, there's no question in my mind, frankly, for a couple of reasons. <clears throat> and number one, he is so well qualified. He's so well experienced. And frankly, he will know what to do day one when he gets in the White House. Whereas the other candidates, they'll have a very steep learning curve. They're going to have to know the levers of power, who's on first, Congress, foreign policy. And Joe will not have to do that. Joe knows what to do. That's very important because we have so many problems in the country today. You, we can't wait around. We, we can't to get the person who's going to knows what to do. Second, he, in my judgment, is the only one that can beat Donald Trump. In my judgment, the other candidates will be chewed up. They'll be just eviscerated by Donald Trump if they're the nominee. Um, he'll there's, there's so much information that Donald Trump, the Republican Party, will have that's going to just chew up the other candidates. But Joe Biden has the best chance of beating Trump. And from my perspective, it's so important that we get somebody who can win, who is civil, um, who, is, um, who gets, has his head screwed on straight, his feet solidly planted on the ground, and a really good guy, and that's Joe Biden. When you look at experience uh, of the candidates, the major candidates of the Democratic Party, it, it's hard to compare them because the vice president really far exceeds. If you were just looking at the resumes of right. these people, they were applying right. for a job, right. there'd be no question about who is best qualified. Why is it so close this late in, given the fact that he is so qualified? Well, I think it's close in part because this is a big decision. You know, Iowans are taking this very seriously. And they're even more seriously than perhaps other elections. So they're looking over the candidates, they, they're waiting, waiting, maybe some new development, maybe there's more information, and it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword because there's so much information available. But uh, tomorrow, it's a big caucus day. <laughs> They're going to have to make some decisions here and make up their mind. And that's great. You know, we have a form of government where the people decide. <laughs> the people, at least the caucus goers tomorrow, are going to make some decisions. Uh, you've been through quite a few of these presidential races, and you know the Democratic Party very, very well. Uh, explain why it is we have a senator who's been there for some time, but he actually uh, votes as an independent, who identifies as a Democratic Socialist who's really that strong a candidate. Is it possible that the Democrats here in Iowa and maybe across the country really want more of a change than Joe Biden represents? I think that people, um, a lot of people, sort of the mainstream America, are, feel that they've not been listened to in the last four, six, even eight years. That the, the elites in Washington, D.C., um, both political parties, too established, um, even the, the, the you know, TV personalities attended be a little elite in the minds of an, an awful lot of people. They really, really want to, uh, somebody to, to, to think about them and take care of them. So they're more inclined now to, to want a more radical change because what's been going on in their view just isn't working for them. The danger is the more radical the change, the more there's not gonna be change. I guess then it'll just be a big fight. You know, in, in life and in Congress, you've got those who are, who are who, who, who think they, who the doers, and those who are just the, the talkers. Well, the talkers are those who want a revolution. Then it will not work. It will not work. They will not be able to get anything accomplished. Whereas the doers are the people a little less vocal in their words, and I think Joe Biden fits that. So you said that you think Donald Trump uh, uh, will be beaten by Joe Biden in a way that he wouldn't yes. be beaten by other candidates or other. I, and my, and my, Why is that? Because there's so, <laughs> Donald Trump and the Republican Party have, will have so much informa uh, information they can use against the other major uh, candidates. Um, because the other major candidates' uh, views are so extreme. Mm -hmm. And when they're so extreme, they're, they're, the Republican Party, Trump's going to take some of that and twist it around and turn it in a very, very negative way to scare people. There's so much material and the campaigns of the other candidates can be used by Trump to scare people. It's very hard to do that with Joe Biden. Joe Biden's been around a while. There's not a lot more that people can say about Joe. And Joe is perceived as being a good guy. He's perceived to be a nice guy. He's perceived to be stable and honest and someone that people can count on. So it's been very hard for the Republican Party to find the nasty stuff against Joe that they will find against the others. It's received wisdom that in the end, voters typically vote their pocketbooks. So we're talking about economic issues. Can Joe Biden persuade people, and let's pick a couple of states here, in Wisconsin, in uh, Michigan, right. Pennsylvania, that Joe Biden will do a better job for the economy than Donald Trump? Because Donald Trump, the economy is not doing badly under him. The economy is not doing badly today. 
well, let's see where the economy is you know, six or eight, nine months from now. But even more important than that, uh, Donald Trump is, is perceived accurately as being very whimsical. He keeps changing his mind um, on trade issues, for example, tariffs and, and, and so forth. And Joe Biden is a lunch bucket guy. Joe Biden in, in Pennsylvania, he comes from Scranton, Pennsylvania. He understands people, he understands jobs, and he's a people person, I, I guarantee you. If Joe Biden's a nominee, he's gonna show to the to American people, especially people in, in, in those electoral college states that are so important, that uh, he, he's got it, he understands it. And I, I think that's gonna really carry the day. But add to that, people do want more civility. They do, and I think that's gonna also be important factor in this race. After a distinguished long career in the Senate, you went to be our ambassador to China. And China is very much in the news right now because of the coronavirus. Uh, give us your estimation of how the Chinese regime, the government, is responding, because it is a very large crisis. It seems to be getting larger by the moment. Yeah, it's, you know, China is, as an authoritarian government, is top down. So a lot of people down lower levels uh, do want to upset the guy at the top. And they are, tend to be not as, as honest and as open about what the problems may be when the coronavirus started to develop. And they're a little less inclined to, to give bad news to the people up the top. And it's, it's a function of the system that's unfortunate. Having said that, uh, China this time around is much more open about the coronavirus than it was about the SARS virus not too many years ago. And, and it's also an opportunity for China. If China can show that it's taken care of the problem, they can get it under control, then that will raise China's stature as a, a country that is in the forefront of finding a, a way to, to deal with a, a vicious problem. It is a big problem. The army in, in, a, in, in the Wuhan, where this broke out, going around different houses and apartments, and they're finding dead people. Come on. Dead people because peop, people who were, were unable to go to the hospital were turned away, so they go back to their apartments and is found dead. There are about well, it's 14,000 cases today. Over 300 people died in, in, in China today. And there's also reports now of deaths in other countries. So that this is, it's, it's really serious. The government knows it's serious. And President Xi also knows that um, he's kind of under the gun now. So the people of China, and also the people around the world, especially the people in China, are going to be looking at him. Is he going to handle this well? Is he going to be our guys so that we can trust in the future? And it depends how well he handles it. If, in fact, the nature of the regime made it difficult in the early stages, yes. perhaps the, the disease got a foothold because they didn't have the bottom-up reporting you described, have they turned around on that subject? For example, the United States has offered help. Are the Chinese accepting the sort of scientific and other help that the world's offering to fix this? Well, they, they're, they're, there are a lot of companies in China that are going out of their way to give billion, not billions, hundreds of millions of dollars in terms of masks uh, and, and medical equipment to help the Chinese government solve the problem. I'm unaware, frankly, of efforts by the United States government or others, but I do know within China there are a lot of very, very wealthy people. I talked to one just two days ago. His company uh, is giving lots of money in, in finding masks. The trouble is there's insufficient supply of, of the right kind of masks in China. And, but so they're, they're struggling with it. But they're, I, I give them credit for recognizing the problem now Perhaps they could have recognized it earlier, but at least they do now, and doing all they can. First and foremost, this is a humanitarian crisis, with people ill and, as right. you say, dying. Right. And that's the most important thing. But it also has economic effects. What's your assessment of the economic effects within China in the short term and the longer term? Well, short term is very significant. Um, people aren't going out. They're not buying stuff. <laughs> they're, they're, uh, companies, factories are being closed down. Starbucks closed their facilities, for example, in China. So short term is, is very, very significant. But Chinese are also savers, the people are. The savings rate among people is much higher than it is, say, in the United States. So they can weather the storm for a little while. It really comes down to the next several days. If, if the next several days the coronavirus seems to have sort of plateaued, it kind of gets under control, then we'll be able to work with this. But on the other hand, if it does not plateau, if it's so virulent, it just keeps getting worse, then we got a whole another magnitude of issues that we're facing, and that's going to certainly have even deeper economic effects.